Psalms 110 this morning, if you will. Psalms 110. Uh, we've been looking at the doctrine of the Godhead. This is actually part 15. I told you I'd do at least 16 because I've got to end on the whole number. And uh, then somebody said, well, 20 is a good number to end on too. And we might be at 20. I don't know. I've been looking into some things in John 17 and so forth to try to wrap this up. But what we've been looking at is Psalms 110, if you will, and, and that thing in where the Apostle Paul, our Apostle, he, it's kind of the theme of this year, and I don't have a theme in that where I keep at it every Sunday. It's kind of an underlining in the background. of There are some things in the Old Testament that our Apostle uh, really kind of requires us to know. And uh, I, I use the word demand, even though I know demand is kind of a, a, a strong word. But he, he really looks at you like you should know some things. And when he talks in 1 Corinthians and he says that you've been called into the fellowship of the Son, the, the Jesus Christ. And then he says in the end of 1 Corinthians, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. See, there's an understanding. He'll say, for us, there's only one God even though everybody else has got all their little G's, the little gods. There's only one God. There's only one creator. And we begin to understand that there's really a doctrine of the Godhead. Colossians 2.10, I'm complete in him. Verse 9, he's the Godhead bodily. So Godhead, Trinity is a word that gets used, and that's okay too. Trinity, three, three, three members of the God uh, that make up God. You could three persons. I've heard it said different ways. And we've really kind of exhausted all of that down through. And what we've been doing over the last uh, three, four studies has been looking at the, the fellowship within the Godhead. You and I are called to be a part of, we are invited, I can say it that way, to fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We are called to fellowship that way. And, and that in that fellowshipping, we looked at 1 John 1, where he talks about fellowshipping, and, it's all, and it was all that if we say, if we say, if we say. Now, 1 John is Israel, tribulation. We understand the doctrinal setting of it. I just wanted you to see what the fellowshipping was. If we say this and we do that, we're a liar. If we say this and we do something else, there's no light in us and so forth. So fellowshipping has to do with words. And understanding the words, understanding the communication. And as they begin to talk amongst themselves, we see it in John 17. Next week we'll spend some time in John 17 and see the real Lord's Prayer. John 17, where the Son talks to the Father. He's on his way to the garden. He's on his way to Calvary. And then we saw here in the Psalms, <clears throat> we started in Psalms 2. And we begin to see the conversation. And then Psalms 45, and then Psalms 102, and now today 110. And we begin to see this great energy of excitement that the father has for his son because his son is delighting in doing what the father's plan and word was. And it has to do with his incarnation. It has to do with his earthly ministry. And it has to ultimately do with Calvary. And then ultimately what it does with you and I today in the age of grace, in the dispensation of grace. And as we begin to see that, one more psalm, Psalms 110. This psalm, we're just going to read, it's only seven verses. I just want to read the verses and then we'll get it, that'll put it in your mind. And then we're going to depart and come back and, and, and just kind of look at what this psalm of David is all about. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's an interesting, my Lord. The Lord, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Jehovah. Here's God the Father speaking to God the Son. We'll see it in just a minute where you get that out of Hebrews, okay? It's a very fascinating psalm. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. 
He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Very fascinating psalm there. Psalms 110, uh, come back with me to Hebrews 12. We're just going to go back. Psalms 110 is a very important psalm in the New Testament. It's quoted a number of times in the New Testament, and especially verse 1 and verse 2. So the psalm of David is gonna re- it's going to be encouragement for the believing remnant as they're going to get down through the 70th week, and they are to focus on the joy that is set before them, the joy that is coming. But yet it's, it's God the Father talking to God the Son as well. <laughs> it's very fascinating. And again, I've told you, and when you come into Psalms, Psalms is not a devotional ditty book, just something to ditty, make somebody have something to read. Psalms is a book of doctrine. It's a book of prophecy for Israel. And, and usually the 70th week, the time coming out there in the future. And we'll see that when we go through Psalms 110. But what's, what is set before, remember last week in Psalms 102, and, and we went in Luke, and, and the Lord's praying in the, in the garden, and there's drops of blood, and the angel comes and ministers to him. And literally how the angel ministers to the, to the son is by reading him Psalms 102, that great encouragement of, hey, you've got to go through the difficulty to get to the kingdom being established. Hebrews 12, if you look at verse 2, Hebrews 12, verse 2, Psalms 110 for the believing remnant is the same way. In the midst of the 70th week of Daniel, when the, the tribulation, the end, we're coming to the last days of, of, of the prophetic program, there, the, the encouragement is, my Lord said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit until it's time to make your enemies the footstool. And when you do that, you're going to do what, verse 2? You're going to storm out of Zion, a rod of my strength, and you're going to liberate the whole bit. Bam, what a day of joy that will be. Psalm, Hebrews 12, verse 2, talking here. Again, this is to the Hebrews doctrinally. I just want you to catch the flavor of, of, the, of, of our Savior. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, in, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see that sitting down at the right hand? That's Psalms 110, verse 1. Come and sit, okay? But notice, here's the Lord. He's going to sit down. So how is he going to get through the tribulation of the cross, the troubling of the cross, the turmoil? What? There's a joy that's set before him, which is what we're going to read in Psalms 110. There's a joy of him doing what? Coming back, avenging his enemies, roaring out of Zion, establishing, building. Psalms 40, uh, 102, building Zion, build, getting that temple, or I'm sorry, getting that city rebuilt and the kingdom established. Boy, what a day of joy that's going to be. Why? Because in the, that literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom, the Godhead is going to be glorified. Boy, what a day. So when the Savior looks at Calvary, it's coming. He doesn't see the trouble. My father, let this pass by. He looks into that cup of the wrath of indignation and says, that's just a walk in the park, man, compared to what's coming. Now, look at us real quick. Look at Romans 8. Because we have the similar, for you and I today, in the age of grace, a similar attitude to have but it comes from an understanding of the joy that was set before him. And that's what Psalms 110 is going to do. It's going to set up the joy because the Savior, the believing remnant, the the tribulation saint that's going to go through that, he's going to have to have an understanding that I can get through this because of what's coming. You and I are the same way. Romans 8.18. For I reckon, Paul's talking, that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The prize that's coming. What is coming our way? Glory. Seated together in heavenly places. So because what gives us the capacity to endure the ugly now and now? (laughs) 
the present suffering of the present time. It isn't because I think God's going to come over here and do something. It's because there's an understanding of what's coming out there in the future. Come over to Hebrews chapter 1. That's why Paul would say, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is what? Gain. He says, hey, you know what? I'm caught between a rock and a hard place here, guys. If I die, I'm, with, I'm in heaven's glory. That's way better. But for you, it's more needful that I stay and do, and that's what I'll have to stay and do for now. So when, they, when, the, when the Jews lay plot to kill Paul, he wasn't worried about it. Could you imagine having that same thought process today in our day? As we worry about the politics or the eco- economics or whatever it is, whoop de doo for your Subaru, as the commercial used to say. Because who's go- he's going to fix it up. He's going to correct it. He's going to set it back. You and I, we're living for what? We're living because we understand. I, I got a message coming to you. It's called Living with the Rapture in View. Why? Because that's what we're looking forward to. There's an ultimate reality of what God's doing today that you and I have an understanding of, and that's the motivation to get down through the present suffering, not just because it's, you know, there. Look at Roman, or Hebrews 1. Just notice this thing about Psalms 110. Get into that. Get into Psalms 110. Uh, uh, Hebrews 1, look at verse 3. Who, so his, dear, his son, verse 2, hath in... Verse 2 hath in, well, just start in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when the Lord's earthly ministry, what days are those? Last days. See that? When he spoke, when he walked the earth, it wasn't the first days, it wasn't the beginning, it's the last of it. The prophetic program is beginning to wind down. Why? Because the Messiah is there, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty, and that's the Father, on high. There's Psalms 110, verse 1. Okay? That's where we're at. Verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. I love, there's Psalms 110. Now think about, we were in Psalms 2, that's chapter 5. Then we went into Psalms 45, we're back here in chapter 1. And then when we went into 102 and stuck right in between it is Psalms 110. See, Hebrews is picking up on the conversation the Godhead is having about the details and the things and the carrying out of the program. Come over to Hebrews 8. And and by the way, carrying out specifically Israel's program, Hebrews 8, verse 1. Not you and I, not the church, the body of Christ, because that was kept secret until it was time to make it known. And we're going to talk about that here. I'm going to throw some stuff on the chalkboard, okay? So you, you got to think about what we're doing here uh, or what the Godhead is doing, what the Father and the Son are talking. By the way, everybody said, well, what about the Holy Spirit? Well, by the mouth of David, the Holy Spirit, what? Wrote, spoke. So when David's writing Psalms 110, Psalm of David, who's speaking? The Holy Spirit's speaking because he's causing David to write it. See, the Holy Spirit's in, actively involved, but who's doing the talking? Well, the Lord, Jehovah, God, the Father, spoke to my Lord, Jehovah, the Son. (laughs) And the Holy Spirit is writing it down. Never discount the, the writing ministry, the work ministry of the Holy Spirit. His job is to cause the book to be written. You got eight, chapter eight now, verse one. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's Psalms 110.1. By the way, later in Psalms 110, he talks about the order of Melchizedek. Wow, what a chief high priest that is. 
that's going to be right here, isn't it? Psalm, uh, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 6, Hebrew, so forth. Come over to chapter 10, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 10. Hebrews 10.10. 10. By the way, sometimes, just as a, a fun study to do on an evening that you don't want to watch TV, or maybe you shouldn't be watching TV, you ought to take the book of Hebrews and see how many of the Psalms show up in Hebrews. It's fascinating. Why? Because Psalms is a book of prophecy, prophesying and looking at the time Hebrews is written and being carried out. Hebrews 10, notice, if you will, verse 10. By the which will. Okay, so which will? The, the will back up in verse 5. But a body thou hast, the sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's that thing in Luke when he says the holy thing. The holy thing is the body that Christ is going to inhabit. The physical body. That's the, the thing. Verse 11, and every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, isn't that Jesus Christ, hath he, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. There's Psalms 110, verse 1. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What's happening here? So when you come back to Psalms 110, and I should have told you to stick something in there. I didn't, so I will now. Come back to Psalms 110. As we begin to look at it, there's some, there is some, a prophetic picture here that we need to catch. Because there's a timing, Psalms 110 verse 1. There's something that Psalms 110 verse 1 and is telling us about the prophetic picture. The Lord, again, the Lord, Jehovah the Father, said unto my Lord, Jehovah the Son, the Messiah, Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That verse is, that statement is a, is, is a statement of time, prophetic time being fulfilled. After he gave himself as the sacrifice, Hebrews 10. So what do we have? We have Calvary, don't we? He died. He was buried and he rose again, right? Please shake your head, yes. I, need, I can't, amen, thank you. I need an amen, there we go. Do I have another one? No. Okay. <laughs> we can get him going here, okay? Think about after his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, what happened? He comes back. He spends 40 days with them. Remember, Acts 1. So where are we? We're in Acts 1, right? Then he ascends. When he ascends, he sits on the right hand of the throne of the, most, of the majesty of high. He's sitting, isn't he? Till, timing word, till, un until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You're going to sit until it's time to stand up and to come back. And when you come back, there's going to be wrath, that 70th week, and you're going to establish the, the kingdom on the earth. And literally what Psalms 110 is going to do is establish a premillennial timeline. Premillennial, not a millennial, before the thousand years. Okay? Now, what happens down here? Well, we get Acts 2, and the Holy Spirit falls on them, and we go through 7. And I knew I messed that up, so we'll just, <clears throat> anyway. All right, so here we've got Psalms 2, we've got Psalms 45, we've got Psalms 102, the Psalms we've been looking at. What happens in Acts 7? Stephen looks up and sees him standing. I got it in the wrong place, so. See what's happening here? 
There's a timing being laid out in Psalms 110, verse 1. Now, I'm going to leave that. We'll come back. Look over with me at Matthew. Well, look at verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of... What's going to... He, you're going to sit until it's time to go make your enemies your footstool. And when you do, the Lord... Again, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah the Father, is sending the who? The rod of thy... Here comes the Messiah. Here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, what is he going to do? He's going to come back out of Zion... And he's going to rule. He's going to set up his kingdom. You with me? Okay. Now, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. I know it's Sunday morning, but we Bible st- we're that freak show on Sunday. We Bible study. Okay. That, that spectacle. That's us. Matthew 22. So what we have is we have the Lord. We have Jehovah talking to Jehovah. Come. You've been down there. You've, you've died, you've been buried, you've resurrected, you've ascended, you come up here until it's time to accomplish the joy that was set before you. The joy, here's the goal, here's the end of it. Here's the, that literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Abrahamic covenant kingdom established on the earth. We're going to have this joy You've endured the cross, you paid for sin, you made the sacrifice, it's done. You go up, you sit down. Why do you sit down? Because it's done. And now you're going to come back and you're going to clean it clocks and you're going to set everything where it needs to be. Okay? Matthew 22. Jesus Christ uses the psalm. The Pharisees have been asking him questions, trying to trick him and catch him. And he's answered them at every time. If you look at verse 15, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Verse 23, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and ask him. So the the councils, the leadership of Israel is trying to trick him. Verse 41, by the way, he answers them all. He answers every one of them. He, he, He shuts them down at every turn. But watch verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now, that's always the problem. We're Q, on Friday night down in Tucson, we had Q&A, and I said, well, I got a question to ask you. And everybody went, no, 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 that's okay. <laughs> you know, right? Well, because what, now he's going to ask them. Now, watch what he says, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit, inspiration, okay, in spirit, inspirate, call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from any man from that day forth, ask him any more questions. But notice the question. How, who is, who's the Messiah here? Who's the Christ? See that? What do you think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said what? The son of David. Okay, then how can the Lord say to my Lord, What's going on here? You see the predicament they're in because they don't believe that he is God and man. They just think he's a good guy. What is he doing here? Simple question, by the way. Whose son is Messiah? Who, if Messiah is David's son, then how can he be David's son and Messiah? How can he be Jehovah? How can he be? Because he's what? Both God and man. He's both. He's Jehovah and the son of David and the son of Abraham. He's both. They don't get that. So they're like, okay, forget it. I'm never asking another question. But you see how he used Psalms 110, verse 1? He says, God the Father, Jehovah, said to God the Son, Jehovah, we're going to do this. Come back to chapter 16 of Matthew. Matthew 16. 
Now, you have to think about this. I, we talked a little bit about this last week. I, you got to think about the being born again stuff. Here's, a, here's another one of those things you got to think about. In Matthew 16, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who, do you, who am I? Who do they say I am? But then he says, verse 15, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isn't that interesting? You see what the issue is? Who do you think I am? Who am I? That was the issue in his earthly ministry. Am I the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of the living God? Or am I somebody else? Just some, am I Jeremiah? Am I one of the prophets? Am I John the Baptist? Who? The identification. Now watch what he does now. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So who told Peter that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God? God the Father did. Okay? And I, verse 18, say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the kingdom, the keys for the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and so forth. You know what, you know what he's doing, Peter? Based on the identification of what you just said, I who I am. What did he say? Verse 16. He's, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Based on that identification of who I am, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build my kingdom on it. I'm going to build the Messianic church. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to build on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is Messiah and is the son of David. And Psalms 110 is right in the middle of all of that because of what it says in verse 1 and 2. He's not building it on Peter. He's building it on who? The identification that Peter made. Peter said, you are it. You're the Messiah, and you're the Son of the living God. And Jesus Christ says, based on what you, the words out of your mouth, Pete, we're going to go for it. And I'm going to give you the ultimate authority because you're the first one to acknowledge that in this conversation. You follow that? See what's happening here. Now, Acts 2. Fast forward to Peter. Acts chapter 2. Now we've got Peter. We got him on the, on the day of Pentecost. So here we're here in Acts 2. And historically, this is where 110 verse 1 is going to take place, historically. Acts 2.22, beginning, uh, oh, let's see, it helps to be in 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him. In the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. They know who he is. They're not acknowledging it, but they know something's up. See? And what you have here is literally Psalms 110, verse 1, going to be fulfilled. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden. They know. They know the event. They're clear of the resurrection. They're on. They got it. Now, slip over to verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all, all our witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the fa Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. You see what's going on in the day of Pentecost? That is the outward evidence that where is Jesus Christ, the son of David? He has risen, and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, Psalms 110, verse 1. That's why he's going to say now, verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he has said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. 
Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is not a good message. That is not a message of wonderful days at Calvary and the, foot, the, level, the, the ground is level at Calvary. No, you by wicked hands crucified him. And you know what? He's made him Lord. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's sitting there until the enemies, his enemies are ready to be made his footstool and he's going to be Lord, the judge, or he's going to be Christ, the Messiah. You need to, you got a choice in the matter of which one he is he. Is he Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer, or is he going to be Lord, the Judge, and the Avenger, and the Deliverer? Which one's he going to be for you? So what do they say, verse 37? What do we do? <laughs> what do we do? And in verse 38, Paul get, or Peter gives them the prescription and what they're to do. What are they to do? They're to change their mind. They're to believe on who he was. Who is he? He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. But where is he? He's Psalms 110, verse 1. He's sitting at the right hand of the majesty of on high. So Psalms 110, verse 1 has been fulfilled. But verse 2 hasn't been yet. I'll give you a little jump to the end here, okay? What's happening? What, what did Hebrews 10 say? Run back there just real quick. What did Hebrews 10 say? Verse 12. By this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That's what he did. He sat down. Why? The work of redemption is over. The work of sacrifice is done. Verse 10 and 11. Every other, think about this. Every pre, he goes up and sits down. The priest of, after Aaron, do you know in the temple there's no furniture to sit on? There's no chair they're always standing, they're always busy, they're always coming and going, working. And yet, what does he do? I did it once for all, and I'm sitting down. Why? Not because he's tired, but because the work is done. Now watch verse 13. For henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his. He knows something. He knows that I'm going to sit here, not permanently, but until it's what? Time to go back and make the enemies the footstool. You see that expecting? That Psalms 110. Because God the Son and God the Father have had a conversation about the joy that was set before him as he's now going to have to come over here and endure the cross and walk through it. So go back to Psalms 110. This, what, Psalm, what Psalms 110 is going to tell us is... It starts being fulfilled at the ascension of Christ. And then it looked to the time when his, he's going to return and make his enemies his footstool. So it has a clear premillennial timeline here. By the way, Psalms 110 says enemies. Acts 2 said foes. Those are different, but they're the same. A foe is an actively engaged enemy. An enemy, you can always be an enemy and never be actively engaged. You're still an enemy. You think about the Cold War. Russia was our enemy. We weren't actively engaged with them on a war front, but they were still our enemy. Now they're our foe because we're actively in, you know, okay, idea. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So the Father's going to talk to the Son about the joy, about what you're going to do. He's already talked to him about Calvary, Psalms 22, Psalms 23, we, okay? He's already talked to him, 45. Now he's going to talk to him about the joy. Acts chapter 2, he ascends up. Acts 1, he ascends up, he's sitting. Acts 1, fulfilled. The first part, he sits. By the way, Acts 7, he sees him standing. That's Psalms 2, ready to, when the Lord laughs and got him in derision, ready to come back and pour out his wrath. But we're going to see that here too as well. Verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The rest of the psalm is going to describe the, the, the returning, the 
set up his kingdom, the, the return to make his enemies his footstool. In Zion, out of Zion, thy strength out of Zion. Where's he coming from? He's coming out of the third heaven. He's coming from sitting on the throne with the God the Father. I'm sitting. It's time. Stephen sees him standing. Why? He's Stephen over there. Well, I get ahead of myself. Thy people, verse 3, shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. You see, he's going to redeem his people out of Zion. He's going to, he's going to redeem. But notice, shall, shall be willing in the day of thy... They're going to be willing to be his cohorts. They're willing to be in the ministry with him. They're willing to bring in the joy. He says, you're going to come back, and what you're going to do, and part of your comeback is you're going to establish that new covenant in them. We saw last week, last time. And he's going to put that new covenant in you, and he's going to write, and they're going to willingly come now and do Matthew 28, and the work in the ministry out there in the, age, in, in the millennial kingdom, the ages to come. They're willingly going to go out to the Gentiles out there and preach to them and teach them and baptize them and convert them. They're not going to argue. They're not going to be rebellious. They were rebellious. You were this. Now you're this. You're God's people. By the way, that hasn't happened yet. Verse 3, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy beauty, uh, in the day of thy power. By the way, if you look there at Matthew 8, 28, he says it in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All the power. It's his. Why? Because of Calvary. Because he went and sat. Now he's coming back. Psalms 110, verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Think about the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood. Again, go back, you can go back to Hebrews 5. You can go back to Hebrews 6. You can go back to Hebrews 7. You can go back. That the idea of the order of Melchizedek. Go back to Hebrews 7. I, easier to show you the verse. Well, it's easier to tell you, but the verse you need to see. That order of Melchizedek is a forever priest. In Genesis 14, he just showed up. He just shows up. And Abraham pays the tithes and, and, and the oblation and everything. Why? He, well, look at Hebrews 7, verse 3. Verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem. By the way, he's the first king of Jerusalem. You see, Salem, Jerusalem, he's the first one. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part, so he tithed, uh, all first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. See his titles? Where, where, without, now watch, father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He has no ancestry. He just shows up. So the order of Melchizedek is this, we have this high priest that is an intercessory for us forever. What did the high priest do? He made that, inter that trek in there once a year, you remember? Who's our intercessory now? Not Levite, not Aaron's people, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of God. He's our eternal priesthood. That's what he's talking about when he, in Psalms 110. That's what he's talking about here in Hebrews. These guys have him. He's there. He is with them always now. He is the priest of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And Israel looks and says, we don't need Aaron. We don't need that. We need him. He's our guy. So when you come back to Psalms 110, He's talking about the, the prophetic order here of what's happening after the death, burial, and resurrection and the ascension. He sits down, but he sits there till it's time to come back. But what is, how does he sit there? He sits there as the chief priest, the high priest, the chief high priest, however you want to say it, of Melchizedek. By the way, again, he sat down. There's no furniture in the temple for Aaron and the boys to sit. 
He's sitting down. Why? He's accomplished the sacrifice. Psalms 110, now verse 5, now here comes the wrath. Here he comes to, here he's coming back to pour out his wrath. Verse 5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook, and the way thereof shall he lift up the head. Think about that. The day of his wrath. You know what he says? He says, my Lord says to to Jehovah the Father, said to Jehovah the Son, you sit here till it's time to come back and make your enemies your footstool. But you know what you're going to do? Here's the joy that's set before you. Your people, you're going to go down there. You're going to come out of Zion. You're going to rule and reign. And your, your people are going to come to you. And they're going to they're be your people. And you're going to be their God. You're going to institute the, North, the, the new covenant with them. You're going to establish them. And then you're just going to go out there and rule and reign. Come over to Zechariah. It's right before Malachi. Right before Matthew. Zechariah 6. You got to catch what's happening. So we've got this picture being painted. Zechariah 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And this is, again, there's four branch titles. This is the man. This is Luke. Matches the four gospels. That's why there's four gospels and not five and not one. You got four behold statements, you got four branch statements, you got four carpenters, you got all you got four all through prophetic portrait of the Messiah. Here's the branch, and he shall grow up into his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now watch, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. Where we're not here, where he's not talking about building it back here. Where is he talking about? Building it over here. Why? Cuz that's where the glory is and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, the priest of Melchizedek. And the council of peace shall be between them both. What's he going to do? He's going to come out of Zion. He's going to rule with the rod. He's going to be right there. He is the sacrifice. He's the priest. He's the king. And that's where he's at. Come over to Acts chapter 7. Did I lose you? I hope not, because I'm almost careful not to call this just basic Bible understanding. <laughs> but you've got to catch what we're doing here, or actually catch what the Father's doing here. Look at Acts 7. In Acts 7, you have Stephen. He goes down through, gives the history. They don't like the fact that he just called them uncircumcised in hearts and ears back there in verse 51. So they go out there, and they have a little early lunch with him. And they gnash on him, they beat him, they kill him. But notice verse 55. Now think about Psalms 110.5, okay? 110.5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. Here's, here's, here's Psalms 110 verse 5 and Acts 7 verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God that's one thing he saw and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and he said behold I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What's the sin? By the way, and he, uh, when he said this, he fell asleep. He died. What was the sin? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, Matthew 12. But why would Stephen cry that? Because of what he saw in verse 55. What does he see? He sees the Lord standing, yes, but he sees the glory. He's, now, that ought to make you think about something. We're gonna, it made me think about something. Go to Matthew. You didn't have anywhere to go today, did you? It snowballs. Matthew. Oh, man, where did it go? 
I just had it right there. Well, it helps to be in Matthew. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. This is a passage about his second coming. I just want you to see what Stephen saw. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. When Stephen in Acts 7 looks in and sees the glory of God, you know what he sees? He sees Michael and the armies of heaven ready to come back and pour out wrath. Matthew 25, 31. He sees the Lord standing, sitting, now we're standing, and what's he coming back to do? The glory, that's the armies, and now it's time for wrath. So we've got a timeline here. We've got his death, burial, resurrection. We have his ascension. He sits. Then we're going to have his, he's going to sit. He's going to return when it's time to, to redeem Israel and set in the new covenant and then judge out the Gentiles all in the day of his wrath. So Acts 2, what do we see? We see he's sitting. Acts 7, we see he's standing. Okay? But go back to Psalms 110. Give me five minutes. And, and then you'll see the wrath of those in the, in the nursery. <laughs> Look at Psalms 110. Look at verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So we're in Acts 2, we're in Acts 7, right? The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength uh, between... Verse 1 and verse 2 of Psalms 110, we have Acts 9. And instead of the Lord sending the rod out of Zion, instead of the Lord the Father doing, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Instead of doing that, what did he do? He talked to a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus, didn't he? He introduced the body of Christ. He introduced the dispensation of grace. He interrupted that prophetic program. Between the period at the end of Psalms 110, verse 1, insert the dispensation of grace. And just as in Acts 7, they laid the feet Acts 8, 1, he's consenting to his death, Saul. In Acts 9, the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Come over to Ephesians 3. Why persecutest thou me? And you know when he said, who art thou, Lord? He was saying, please don't say Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> please don't. And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And you know Saul just brokenhearted, said, oh, yeah, yeah. Here it comes. Because he knew and yet, what does he say? No, I'm going to do something new with you. Ephesians chapter 3. You see, the dispensation of grace, the church, the body of Christ, fits between Psalms 110 verse 1 and Psalms 110 verse 2. It, the dispensation of grace interrupts the premillennial prophetic timeline. Ephesians 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the, son, unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the, script, by the Spirit. What is that? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Boy, he interrupted that right when he's supposed to. He says, you're going to sit until it's time. Stephen sees him standing, and he says, not yet. I got so, we gotta, we're going to institute the secret that was hidden in God. I hit it. Verse 10. 
Well, verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, I got a thing to do. We're going to pull the secret out and we're going to reveal this now. We're going to use that guy Saul of Tarsus down there because he was leading the rebellion against. He's the one that we're going to use. He's going to do this. And the next thing you know, We've got an interruption here. No more wrath. Now it's peace and grace. And that's the condition today. And he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do all of this according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Colossians 1. You see, folks, we are not a plan B. We're not a, whoops, they messed up, now we got to fix it. We're not that at all. The dispensation of grace is something that he had planned according to the eternal purpose of of the Godhead. He had planned before the foundation of the world, and he kept it secret before the foundation, and he kept it secret since the foundation when he created. And that's where we're going to fellowship with the Godhead, is in that. God wants to fellowship with us in what He is doing today. And we're to understand what the Father is doing. Colossians 1, verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy. And He goes on, and this great, oration here, he wants, us, he wants to fellowship with us in what he's doing today. In our part, we have to come to some understanding of some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We have to have his mindset. What was his mindset? I can endure because I know this is coming. What can we do? We can endure Because we're going to get called out, we're going to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to take up those heavenly places out there so we can endure. We can fellowship with Him. We can have the same mindset. Okay? All of that out of Psalms 110. Because it's right there. Now we'll move on next week, okay? Not not out of the subject, but to a different passage. Psalms is full of it, by the way. I just picked those four. <laughs> you can go to a lot of them where they're, they're conversating. They're talking. And you keep reading in Colossians, and you know what the Father says? You're the preeminent one to the Son. Why? Because all of it's filling up with you. And you're the one. And if you're in Him, then guess what? You're in the one. That's why you're made complete in Him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. You're not in the bellhop, you're in the CEO, the president, okay? All right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we're able to look into your word, see these things, rejoice in them, and have them become a part of our understanding. And understanding that we're not in Psalms 110, but we've interrupted it. And we know that one day you will come back for us, take us home, And then you will finish out your program for the earth as you finish out the program for the heavens. And we'll thank you for that and we'll appreciate that and we'll walk worthy in that. In your name we pray, amen.